Hey everybody, happy Friday. Welcome to the briefing room here at ABC News. I'm Devin Dwyer. Very busy day today up on Capitol Hill. Uh, glad to have you with us. We're going to start uh, with the acting attorney general in the hot seat. Now, if you care about the Russia investigation and you're hoping for that thing to be handled professionally, impartially, then you'll want to hear what the man who's been overseeing it for the past three months has to say. This is the first time that acting attorney general Matt Whitaker has gotten grilled by Congress. He's been three months on the job. In six days to go, and boy, there were some fireworks today uh, from Democrats who want to make sure he has not interfered with Robert Mueller's probe. Our Pierre Thomas, Chief Justice Correspondent, has been in the room for this. It's going on six hours now. Pierre, you're just outside where the Attorney General uh, appears to be wrapping up. Um, what's your impression so far? He seemed to repeat over and over again uh, for the first time on the record that he has not interfered in any way. Well, I guess the key word I would use today would be intense. The Democrats today simply were questioning the man's integrity. They were questioning how he got the job. They were questioning whether he's done anything to impede the special counsel. And it really was all about how he came to become uh, the acting attorney general after uh, General Sessions, Attorney General Sessions, uh, was forced out of the job. And intense it was. Let's take a, list, a listen to one of the opening exchanges between Chairman Jerry Nadler, Democrat of New York, and the acting attorney general. Uh, they were uh, spar uh, sparring very early on today. Take a listen. Now, in your capacity as acting attorney general, have you ever been asked to approve any request or action to be taken by the special counsel? Mr. Chairman, uh, I see that your five minutes is up, and so um, <laughs> I'm. We, 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 I am here, I'm here voluntarily. I, we have agreed to five minute rounds. And the committee. I think that's a fine place to end the five minute rule. The, the committee will end, will, 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 will come to order. I want to be very specific about this, Mr. Chairman, because I think it's going to ally a lot of fears uh, that have existed um, among this committee, among the uh, legislative branch largely, and, and maybe among some American people. Uh, we have followed the special counsel's regulations to a T. There has been no event, no decision that has required me to take any action, and I have not interfered in any way with the special counsel's investigation. And Pierre, those assurances aside, Democrats today really seem to zero in on Whitaker's statements from a couple weeks ago where he said that Mueller was close to finishing his report and that those decisions would be reviewed. Today, Democrats wanted that explained, but he didn't really elaborate on what he meant by reviewing Mueller's decisions, did he? Uh, he did not. And he, here's the key. As the acting attorney general, he's not recused himself from the investigation. So he has final say on anything in regarding the special counsel at this point. Now, the backdrop here for our viewers at home and people watching this is that he had been a commentator as a private citizen before he came to the Trump administration. And in that time, he had some very critical things to say about the special counsel investigation in terms of whether it was a, uh, appropriate, uh, whether there had been any evidence of wrongdoing found. So basically, the Democrats were saying, given that, how can you uh, claim now that you're impartial and unbiased in connection to this investigation that you're now overseeing? And Pierre, uh, you know, we also know that they've, they've issued or threatened some subpoenas uh, of Matt Whitaker to answer some of these questions. Sounds like he may be coming back to be deposed under oath again, perhaps, before he uh, leaves office. Uh, but all of this questioning around Robert Mueller wasn't the only subject that brought up today. Tell us what else popped in the hearing um, and, and, and also describe some of those tense moments around the family separations policy, which Whitaker had a hand in at the southern border. Uh, one of the most dramatic and heated moments is one of the, one of the congresswomen uh, pressed him on the family separation uh, issue in terms of could they properly track uh, the, the children who had been separated from their families. And she just was not satisfied with the answer that she was getting from the acting attorney general. And she made that clear to him. Uh, she was exasperated. And just you, you could literally cut the tension in the room when it was happening. Yeah, pretty powerful moment. Uh, Pierre Thomas, thanks so much for your reporting. Unless you get back in there, know you have much more reporting to do, and we'll be uh, reporting tonight on World News and World News Prime here on ABC News Live. Thanks a lot, Pierre. 
Uh, shifting gears now to the, one of the other major stories of this week happening across the river over in Virginia. Of course, the political turmoil that has gripped the state of Virginia and the top three political officials in that state. Uh, it's now been exactly one week uh, since that uh, racist picture appeared in the yearbook of Governor Ralph Northam. Uh, and if there's one thing this past week has taught us, it's that blackface uh, has been a phenomenon that has shown striking persistence on the campuses of American colleges and universities stretching into the uh, 1980s, 1990s. Uh, and to talk a little bit more today about blackface uh, and its place in American society, a conversation that's been going on all week, I want to bring in Leah wright Rigour. She's an assistant professor of public policy at Harvard University, the Kennedy School of Government. She's also a historian of race uh, and American politics. It's great to see you, Leah. Thanks for coming in. Um, as a student of history myself, um, you know, I th when I think of blackface, I think of the late 19th century, early 20th century, but I've sort of been surprised this week to see so many examples, instances of it popping up, not just in the 80s and 90s, but very recently. Why is this still happening? Well, you know, we've seen a lot of incidents happen in the last couple of days, the last couple of weeks, even the last couple of months. And we've seen it happen across, you know, multiple industries, uh, platforms, politics, things like that. Um, but we shouldn't necessarily be surprised that it's happening because this has been pretty consistent. So every year we hear about dozens, particularly around uh, Halloween, we hear about dozens of incidents of blackface. We hear about incidents, you know, connected to people and public officials. You know, if we were to comb through every yearbook in America, we would probably find a lot of horrifying uh, images uh, that people would not be proud of. So blackface is nothing new. Now, why does it persist? Well, there are a lot of different reasons why it continues to persist. You know, there's uh, uh, one aspect of racial ignorance, and we hear this kind of, uh, we hear people pleading about this a lot. Uh, Governor Northam mentioned racial ignorance. But at the same time, uh, there is an explicit understanding, especially right now, uh, that blackface is taboo, it's dehumanizing, it's often violent, uh, so that's not actually explaining, fully explaining what's going on. To that, we have to look at this idea that maybe people are just, you know, were uh, engaging in blackface knowing all of this and just didn't think that they would get caught. Yeah, in, in, in Ralph Northam, as you alluded to there, I'm thinking back to the press conference he had last weekend, sort of admitted as much. He said, look, when he came out and shocked everybody and said that he had put on shoe polish for a Michael Jackson contest in the 80s, he said he, he's, in his words, he's still learning. He didn't think at the time that this was an offensive thing. How do you explain to people out there, um, particularly in the middle of the country, southern parts of the country, who simply, uh, you know, younger people who didn't grow up in that generation, how do you explain why that's so offensive? Help us sort of hone that message for our audience. Well, the easiest way to look at it is that blackface has long been used as a way to ridicule, mock, and most importantly, dehumanize uh, uh, black people. It's often used uh, to dehumanize uh, other racial groups as well. If we look at Latinos and we look at uh, Asian Americans, if we look at uh, Native Americans, we see different incidents of, you know, blackface, yellowface, brownface um, uh, it, uh, across the United States. So the other part of this is that, you know, blackface is often, as it dehumanizes, as it ridicules, as it mocks, as it hypersexualizes African Americans, as it suggests that African Americans uh, are dumb or inferior, it also opens the door for violence. Why? Because you don't treat people, uh, 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 you know, appropriately. Uh, you often treat them with violence when you are able to dehumanize them. So there's a connection right there between blackface and violence, and there's long been this historical connection between blackface and violence, right? We can look at something like Birth of a Nation, for example, to see the connection. We've seen it be so swiftly condemned in Virginia. That was interesting uh, when R Ralph Northam's photograph, the racist photograph, appeared last Friday, one week ago, in his medical school yearbook. Um, and then we learned, of course, about the attorney general, who admitted he also had had an experience with blackface. Uh, what do you think about the instant reaction we've seen there from so many Democrats, national to state level, that this sort of behavior, even if 20, 30 years ago, is automatically disqualifying for political office? Do you think... As some are saying that that's political correctness gone too far, uh, or do you think that is an appropriate response to this day and age, um, given that behavior? Well, I think it both comes from a moral uh, position, right? So this idea that uh, blackface and what it represents 
is a moral outrage. It's a moral wrong. It is, you know, dehumanizing. It's connected to violence. It has this long, awful, racist history. And that's so it sounds like you think the answer is yes. Well, but the other side of this, and this is what's coming up in terms of all of these conversations with Democrats, once it's affecting their own political, you know, uh, politicians, their own elected officials, is should it be disqualifying if that person's policies and the ways that they've governed don't reflect right, the violence uh, that we often see linked to blackface? And so there's no easy answer to that. But for Democrats, right, the moral answer would suggest this is disqualifying. You must step down because this is the line that they have held, you know, across the years and across the decades. Right now, they're trying to figure out does that apply to their own party? And according to the Virginia Black Legislative Caucus, yes, they are still calling for Ralph Northam to step down. It's, that's an interesting distinction you make between the politics and, of course, the political platform of the Democratic Party in Virginia. Also, just this moral question, which, of course, has also included a discussion this week of forgiveness, openness, uh, you know, one's heart, if you will, in the process. Maybe perhaps that's a different matter. Um, if you weren't in politics, interesting to see just a few minutes ago, actually, Ralph Northam, I think we have the tweet, Governor of Virginia did tweet for the first time in a week. We've heard from him, and he tweeted out a picture uh, of a meeting he's had just this afternoon uh, in his office down in, in Richmond, Virginia, with the president of the National Black Farmer Association. Uh, there it is. He says, I've enjoyed hearing from John Boyd today. Thanks for your work. Uh, on behalf of black farmers. So perhaps here, Ralph Northam, again, showing, trying to show at least publicly that he's taking these steps, uh, and we shall see how that plays out. Sort of status quo politically today, Ralph Northam is still governor, Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax is still there, uh, and uh, Mark Herring, the Attorney General, still sticking in there. Uh, it's great to have you with us, Leah wright Rigour from Harvard University. Thank you so much, and uh, appreciate your perspective. Thank you. Uh, moving on now to another major development that popped overnight here in Washington, the Supreme Court weighing in for the first time in a long time, uh, at least with the conservative majority on the court, on the issue of abortion. They uh, overnight delivered a stay, an emergency stay, of a Louisiana abortion law that would impose some new restrictions on abortion clinics in that state. We want to bring in our legal analyst, Kate Shaw, now, who joins us uh, by Skype to kind of break this down. Kate, give us your bottom line on what's happened here and what the order means uh, that the justices approved last night. Sure. Well, so, Devin, when President Trump picked Brett Kavanaugh to replace Anthony Kennedy, I think the big question was what that change might mean for the law of abortion. Kennedy had voted to uphold Roe versus Wade on a number of occasions, and this was one of the big questions uh, swirling around Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, remember when Susan Collins cast the decisive vote in favor of then-Judge Kavanaugh, she said that she had been uh, assured that he, that she was confident that he would respect precedent and that he wouldn't cast a vote to overturn Roe versus Wade. Uh, and I think, as you said, we now have from last night, our first evidence of how this newly constituted court might approach abortion. And I think it has abortion rights advocates, um, both extremely nervous uh, in terms of what Judge Cap Justice Kavanaugh said in his dissent, but also with a glimmer of hope in that Chief Justice Roberts joined the liberal justices on the court to put this Louisiana law on hold, at least for now. Uh, so this law would require doctors to have admi admitting privileges at a nearby hospital before performing abortions. Uh, the court struck down a Texas law that was very similar to this Louisiana law um, in 2016, so just about two years ago. Uh, and, you know, now there's a question. The court looks different. Might this law withstand scrutiny, even though the Texas law did not? And at least for now, the answer is the court says the law is on hold while the consideration runs its course in the lower courts and before the Supreme Court. But Judge Kavanaugh wrote a dissent just for himself, uh, arguing that the law should be permitted to go into effect. Um, and it has a lot of people wondering about what the future might hold in terms of his votes in abortion cases and, in fact, just the law of abortion more broadly. Yeah, and to get a little bit more of a perspective on uh, what this could mean on the ground in Louisiana, I want to bring in Ellie Schilling. She's an attorney with Lyft Louisiana. It's a nonprofit abortion rights advocacy group uh, that works with the state's four uh, abortion clinics. Many of them were mentioned uh, in, in, in Judge Kavanaugh's dissent last night. It's great to see you, um, Ellie. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, help us understand, for those of us who, who haven't been to Louisiana, how difficult it is right now for women to access abortion services in that state, and how much more difficult would it be if this law is allowed to go into effect? Uh, thank you for having me. Um, first, uh, actually, there's only three abortion clinics that are currently providing services in Louisiana. 
um, and they're only in the sort of the largest cities in the south and the north of the state. So women already have uh, increased driving times over just the access that they had a few years ago, um, and then increased wait times at, at clinics. Uh, there, this state also has one of the highest poverty rates for women and children in the country. So women are, for, are already facing a lot of economic insecurity um, in a state that you know won't raise the minimum wage, um, that won't pass legislation on, on equal pay. So you know issues with health care access are, are significant already. And if this law had gone into effect, then it would have closed most, if not all, of the clinics in Louisiana. So those burdens are just dramatically increased then at that point about whether there even is a clinic at all in, in the state for women to, to access, and then what that looks like in terms of drive times, wait times, um, added expense with, with needing to spend the night um, in a city far away from your home. Uh, those burdens obviously also fall even more heavily on minors. Um, who have less access to resources, less access to transportation, um, perhaps no access to a trusted parental figure that could help them travel uh, out of state across state lines if, um, if the access and restrictions become too severe here. So can I drill down with you on that uh, for a second? Judge Kavanaugh last night in his dissent, sort of as Kate was talking about, took a middle ground, suggesting that uh, the law as describes you're describing it is not perhaps as onerous uh, as it might seem. He seemed to say, in his opinion, that the three doctors in Louisiana who don't currently have admitting privileges for hosp hospital could pretty easily get that within the 45-day transition period. Uh, so I guess the question is, why is it unreasonable to have these three doctors get that those privileges? And, and uh, is it really that hard to get the privileges such that it would cause those clinics to close down? Sure. I think it's important to understand that those findings that Kavanaugh uh, sort of focused in on from the Fifth Circuit are directly in contrast to the factual findings that the district court found. The district court found that all of the abortion providers had attempted, had made numerous attempts to obtain privileges and that they had not been able to. And the reason for that is actually fairly simple. Uh, for one thing, it's because abortion is so safe. The procedure itself uh, has a complication rate that, re that, that a complication rate when hospitalization is required that's less than one percent. So hospitals don't have any reason to give admitting privileges to physicians who are not going to admit patients. Um, there can also be issues for hospitals that they can draw protesters outside of their facility if they affiliate with abortion providers. Um, there are state-run hospitals or religiously affiliated hospitals that won't give privileges um, to, to physicians who provide abortions out of just principle. Um, so there are significant barriers, and it's unlikely if not impossible, um, for most abortion providers to obtain admitting privileges. And they've had applications pending at this point for, for years. Hmm, so there's no reason to think that in the next 45 days, as, as, as Justice Kavanaugh um, wrote in his dissent, that that, that would, would change. And quickly, Ellie Schilling, uh, thank you for joining us from Louisiana, and this perspective is, is fascinating. Uh, give us your sense of John, uh, uh, your take on John Roberts. He, uh, of course, voted against striking down the similar Texas law, but again, last night supported the at least temporary stay here. How concerned are you uh, that the Chief Justice could swing the other way when this case, if, assuming the case, does come before the full panel sometime next year? Uh, I'm very concerned about that. Um, however, I think that his his vote with the, the liberal wing of the court is a very good sign, at least, that he is concerned about the integrity of the court and that he would rather put the integrity of the court above politics. If they either did not grant the stay or if they ultimately reverse this case on, on the merits, then it will really gut their precedent. Um, not only Roe, but also the Texas case that you were speaking of before, Whole Woman's Health, which is a very recent decision. Um, so I think that it, it's that it is encouraging that that Justice Roberts is is viewing this from a sort of institutional perspective. That it's very important for the court to send the message that its precedent matters, and that lower courts will not be permitted to just ignore or to misapply Supreme Court precedent.
And Kate Shaw, real quickly before we let you go, um, as Ellie is talking about there, this precedent back in the spotlight in the crosshairs, if you will, what does this Louisiana case tell us about forthcoming challenges to Roe versus Wade in the coming months? Yeah, I think this is, you know, in some ways testing the waters, right? This law is almost identical to the Texas law that the court struck down a couple of years ago. If the court is willing to reverse course, um, it wouldn't necessarily reverse Roe outright. I would be surprised if it did, but it could uphold this Louisiana law and gut, if not overturn, this very recent case, Whole Woman's Health, out of Texas. And if that happens, then I think... Um, opponents of abortion are going to try very quickly to get a case before the Supreme Court that would squarely present the question of the constitutionality um, of the constitutional protection for abortion and the future of Roe. So I think that all eyes in the near term are going to be, just as you said, on Chief Justice Roberts. The court, I think, took a real beating in the public eye over the course of the very contentious Kavanaugh confirmation hearings. So I can well imagine the Chief Justice wanting the court to appear removed from politics in the wake of that experience, at least for the near term. So I think there is reason to believe the Chief Justice may be willing to side, not just at this preliminary stage, but when the court hears the argument uh, with the liberal wing and with abortion rights supporters. But I, I, long term, I think that uh, abortion uh, advocates have real reason to be concerned that, you know, Justice Kavanaugh really does change the balance on the court for the foreseeable future. Yeah, this Louisiana case is going to be a blockbuster one next year for sure. Kate Shaw, great to see you. Thank you so much. Have a nice Thanks, weekend. Daniel. And Ellie Schilling, uh, attorney with Lyft Louisiana, great to have you with us as well. Thank you so much. Uh, finally today, it is 2020 season as we've been covering here this week, 2020 presidential campaign season that is here in the briefing room and all the candidates, many of the candidates descending on Iowa this weekend. Believe it or not, we're just about a year away from the Iowa caucuses. The first votes will be cast in the presidential campaign just over a year from now. And that's where our Rachel Scott is. She's out on the trail tracking some of the new Democratic candidates. Rachel, great to see you. I know you've been out there uh, following Mayor Pete Buttigieg. He's out there and also Cory Booker. Give us, uh, give us the latest. Yeah, well, we're more than 600 days away, Devin, but, you know, who, who's counting, right? Who's counting? Um, you know, this is the time where all of these candidates are flocking to Iowa. And again, this is a key state because it, held, it holds one of the first caucuses in the nation. So it really sets the tone for the rest of the nation. I actually just stepped out of the room here because... Senator Cory Booker is holding a community forum behind me. You could see through the glass right there. We have a shot set up to give you a live feed inside right now. He's meeting with community leaders here in Waterloo um, and talking to them. And, you know, the folks in there told me that this is a very strategic move, okay? So President Obama, right after announcing his candidacy for president in, um, in Illinois, this was his first stop in Iowa, in Waterloo. And the reason being is that this really, uh, residents tell me that this part of the this part of the state, Waterloo, really is reflective of the rest of the nation. It is diverse, 15% African American, big diversity push here, and then also a lot of manufacturing hubs are here as well. And so you have these core issues of minimum wage, of health care, of prison reform, of you know uh, mental health that keep coming up in this area, and those seem to be key issues that we're seeing reflected across the state, and in many cases across the country. And so this is just one event. This is the senator's second event today. He's going to be traveling across the state, and I'm going to be with him, and he'll have a few other events, and we'll be bringing those to you um, as and reporting on, on those events as well. Um, but again, we're over 600 days out, and you already see such a huge push here in Iowa. The senator actually has some Iowa roots. His maternal grandmother was born in Iowa. He has an aunt that's 99 years old that still lives in Iowa. And so, you know, you're seeing him take a really personal approach here. But definitely on the, among the topics that came up in there, um, I would say that minimum wage was huge. And uh, Senator Cory Booker said that he wanted to see an increase in minimum wage to $15, something that we have heard him say before. He made an added push for that. And also more uh, criminal justice reform. Um, and he touted his efforts on that already as a senator, but said that more could be done and he wants to see more done. He applauded the president's uh, First Step Act um, that was enacted, but he said he we need to take a, you know, a larger focus on that. And that was definitely one of the concerns here um, from residents. One resident said, you know, you come to Iowa on vacation and you leave on probation. Pretty strong words from residents here in Iowa. 
All right, those uh, Waterloo residents getting a taste of Cory Booker. Many more candidates sure to come through. Rachel Scott, drive safely out there. I know it's snowy uh, in Iowa. Hope you have some warm boots. I know you're headed up to Amy Klobuchar, senator from Minnesota. She has a big announcement that she is making on Sunday, so we'll stay tuned for that. We'll see you, uh, see you soon out there, Rachel. Thank you so much. Uh, finally today on this Friday, uh, we got to kick with something a little bit lighter. Believe it or not, our old friend, John Boehner, the Republican, former Republican House Speaker. You remember John Boehner, there he is. Uh, well, he's actually making some news today, kicking off a national campaign to reform federal cannabis laws. He's now the head of the National Cannabis Roundtable. He's calling for pot to go mainstream. He wants all federal restrictions lifted on marijuana. They want cannabis companies to bank in American banks and make those sales legal coast to coast. All right, John Boehner. Let's see what you got. We'll be keeping an eye uh, on that for sure. Great to have you with us here in the briefing room on this Friday. Hope you have a great weekend. I'm Devin Dwyer in Washington. We'll see you next time.